Welcome to our legal forum this evening. So tonight's forum is part of the Orange County Clerk of Courts Legal Matters Forum Series, and this evening's topic is Clerks Against Domestic Violence. Of course, it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'm Dane Weister, the Communications Director here at the Orange County Clerk of Courts, and we thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope the information provided during this free legal forum is informative and useful to you. You'll be able to ask questions, and you can just type your questions you have through the Q&A function on your screen that you see there. Uh, type in your questions, and we will get to your questions and try to get to all questions uh, towards the end of our webinar. And we'll have that Q&A segment towards the end, and you can fill out. We also ask you to fill out a survey at the end of our presentations, and that helps us uh, with future information on uh, what you thought about tonight's presentation. So this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Clerk of Courts social media channels. We actually had a little bit technical difficulty trying to connect live to our Facebook page. So we will get this webinar up on our Facebook page for you tomorrow. And also you can access it through our website, which is myorangeclerk.com. Okay, so let's get right into it. Let me introduce to you your Orange County Clerk of Courts, Tiffany Moore Russell. Thank you, Dane. And hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening for our legal forum on domestic violence awareness. I personally initiated these free legal forums called Legal Matters as a service for the community to make legal and court information more easily accessible. These forms are one of the best ways to provide our community access to justice and access to the important information you all have the right to know. All forms are always free to attend and holding these legal forms virtually has created new opportunities for us to bring them to you much easier. I want to take the time to acknowledge my staff who have worked hard to bring this webinar to fruition, as well as acknowledge our panelists who are here with us today. For my office, we have Assistant Manager Jose Fallon from our Family Services Division. And from Harbor House of Central Florida, we have Director of Youth and Community Services, Daniel Ortiz. And we also have with us, we will hear from the Orange County Sheriff's Office Assistant Squad Leader for Civil Injunctions, Sandra Lane Cole. Thank you all for taking time to share your valuable insights with our community. So now let's kick this off with a new initiative that we would like to share with all of you out here that many, all the clerks across the state of the Florida has implemented. And it is the Hope Card um, Program. Next slide, Pete, please. All right, so the Hope Card, as it relates to domestic violence, today I'm here to share with you all about another tool that our office and clerks of court statewide recently rolled out to assist survivors of domestic violence. During this year's legislative session, the Florida legislature passed a new statute to implement a HOPE card program by the 1st of October. And we are pleased to carry out this program to support, to support domestic violence survivors. This new tool, next slide please, this new tool is what is called a HOPE card. As you see here, it's a free wallet sized card that survivors can use to verify with law enforcement that they are covered by a protective court order. These cards help a survivor show law enforcement they have a final protective order without having to carry all the court paperwork with them all the time. The HOPE card is issued once a final injunction for protection is ordered by the court. All a survivor has to do is request a HOPE card with the clerk of courts in the county where the petition was originally filed. Next slide. HOPE cards will identify the name and birth date of the person protected by the court order the name and birth date of the respondent, and certain information relating to the protective order, such as the case number, type, and date the order expires. A HOPE card is valid for two years after the date the final order is issued or the expiration of the restraining order, whichever is earlier. At the Orange County Clerk of Courts, you can request a HOPE card directly from our website, which is myorangeclerk.com, and we will provide the HOPE card via email. Or if someone would like a printed card, we can provide that on request in our family and probate mental health divisions at the main downtown courthouse. Again, details on how to get a HOPE card can also be found on our website at myorangeclerk.com. Now, that's enough about our HOPE card program and there's additional information 
on the website. I'm going to now hand this off to Family Division Assistant Manager, Jose Pilon, who has more information on the types of injunctions and how you can file for them. Jose? Um, thank you, Clerk Rosso, and good evening, everybody. So, um, next slide, Charlene. So what is an injunction for protection? So most, most people are know an injunction for protection as a restraining order. And that's when you're trying to keep somebody away from you due to domestic violence or for um, stalking or somebody that it make you uncomfortable. It's not a criminal matter, but it, it could become a criminal matter if that person do not follow the court order if, they, if the injunction get approved. Next. So an order of protection. So what happens if the if the court grants this order of protection? So they can, in, in some cases, they might, um, the person that you file in the restraining order against to can be asked to leave the dwelling or the, or the home that can prevent that person to go into you, to the school. And in some cases, they can give you temporary custody. And in some cases, even award child support if the order of protection is approved. So very important. So we have five types of restraining orders. So when you come to the clerk office and to our office, it's important that you know which uh, uh, type of injunction you're filing. Even though there's five different types of injunctions, they're all the same. However, the court can reject the restraining order if you select the wrong um, injunction. So we're gonna go in details of what, what each, um, each injunction um, um, requirements is required for each type of injunction. Next. So domestic violence. A domestic violence injunction is filed when you're filing against um, an ex-spouse, a, a, a husband, somebody that's been living with you in the same household. It could be by blood related or it can be just living together. It can also be if, um, if they have a child in common. Next. So like, like I, I stated before, so and this what is important in this type of injunction is that it can be it can be against a spouse, somebody that you've been living together, or you have child together. And it could be also it could be mom against son, or it can be father against it has to be the same, the same um um it has to be uh, related by blood or living together. And it's important to know that to able to file a restraining order, you have to be over 18 years old. So if when you file an injunction, if if you are a minor, a, a person that is have custody over you, it will have to file on your behalf. Next. Stalking. So stalking is a different type of injunction. So this is when somebody that you don't live with that person, uh, you don't have any relationship with that individual. However, this person had have making threats against you. They're following you, following you, and they uh, repeatedly they're harassing you. So that's when you file in a stalking um, injunction. Next, repeat balance. What is important about repeat balance is in this type of injunction, you need to have two acts of balance. Normally, this injunction is filed when you're filing against a court worker or against a nerve board, but the important and important part of this injunction is there have to be two acts of balance. Again, like I stated before, if you don't state the two acts of balance in this type of injunction, the court cannot grant you an injunction. So important that you know that two acts of balance happen with the past six months. Next. Sexual balance. This type of injunction, uh, uh, it's against sexual battery. Normally this happens with uh, minors and this is when you will file, uh, an adult will file on your behalf if, if you were a minor in that case. But in, what, is, what is different about this type of injunction has to be reported to the police. Uh, sometimes a criminal act happened and that person is in, in jail or through going through an investigation, but it has to be reported. Or sometimes the person is re, re, um, ready to be released from jail so that's when you file a sexual balance um, injunction. And in most cases, this is when you, it, it's filed, it, it gets filed when you are uh, a minor. You file on behalf of a minor. Next. Dating balance. So this is like it sounds in a dating balance. And this is um, 
an injunction you file against somebody that you were dating, you're not living together. This is the difference between domestic violence and dating violence. You're not, you're not living together, but you're just dating casually and just going out, and, but you feel that uh, a, a person is stalking you or you're having problems with that person, that you need to keep that person away from you, that's when you file a dating violence. Next. So the, what are the type of relationships? It's just somebody, like I stated, somebody that you were dating when they're six, six months, not living together, how he be involved over time with that person, where this person expects some kind of a uh, relationship with that person. And, 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 and that's that's when you file a dating balance. And, and what is important to know here is that you're not living with this person because if you were living with this person for a period of time, you will file a domestic balance. This is just dating. No, no, you're not living together. You're dating and, um, and, and socializing with this person, but you're afraid of this person at this point. Next. So restraining order. A restraining order, there's no fee to file a restraining order when you come to the clerk office. Next. How to file a restraining order? A restraining order is filed in the county that you reside, where the respondent lives. And when I say the respondent, that's the person that you file an injunction against. So that's, if the person lives in Orange County, you can file in Orange County. If you reside in Orange County, you can file in Orange County, or where the violence occurred. There are times that you can be working in a different county, and that's where the actual violence occurred. You can file in that county. But it's important that we follow those steps because if you don't follow that, the court can deny you injunction. And in Orange County, you can file in person, and you also and it's like, uh, also you can file online. Uh, we are open from 7.30 to 4, and our, our address in the downtown, um, in, uh, downtown courthouse. Next. So how you how you file restraining orders? So when you come to our office, we are located in the third floor of the courthouse, room 320. So when you come to the courthouse, you come to our office and it's going to be a triage test. In that triage test, they're going to give you a pamphlet that they're going to give you all your five type of injunctions. And you need to select the, the injunctions that um, go with your situation. And it's important that you read it, take your time. Once you select that injunction, we're going to give you the paperwork and everything that you need to file. If if you need to print extra documents and you have uh, emails that you want to attach to you um, to your narrative, this, uh, we have computers that you can utilize in the self help center. So it's important that um, so when you come and file that paperwork, you will file it with us. And then, let's say you're coming on a Monday and you file your restraining order, then you will come the following day to find out the response. I mean, if the court grants you an injunction, you will have to come back in two weeks to court. During that two weeks period, we're going to send all the paperwork to the sheriff's department that they're going to serve the defendant or the respondent that you file or the person you filing the, the, the case against. Once that person gets filed, you will go to court. And if the court, the court agree with everything that you were saying in your, um, in your paperwork, uh, they can make the injunction permanent for one year. And sometimes they can make it um, a lifetime injunction. Next. So in the process of filing uh, an injunction, we also have, we partnered with Harbor House. And Harbor House, they have, they have counselors, they, have, they, can, they can give you a safety plan, and they can tell you what to do and what to expect in, a, in, a, in the process of filing an injunction. They can also help you with what to expect when you go to court. And if you need to bring any documentation to, to help you or move your case along. Next. So also you can file an injunction 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we have paperwork in our website, my orangeclerk.com that you can download, fill out the paperwork and file, uh, file the paperwork to the Florida court e-filing portal. So it's make sure uh, it's, may, it's important that you read those documents on the on the website and you select the appropriate injunction you can fill it out file it there and once you file online you will have to come back the following day to find out your response because all those injunctions at the beginning when they are filed they're confidential cases and you will have to come back in person to find out the response next tips put for staying safe 
Or, uh, any any restraining order, it's it just, uh, it's, a, it's a document. So it's important that if you're in immediate danger, you call 911. We also have, you can uh, utilize Harbor House at 24 a day, and there's a, a number is stated here, 407 at 86 And in the event that you file a restraining order and it gets approved, that's a civil injunction on that matter. But if the person, the defendant that you file or the person you file the injunction against continue with the same behavior, you can file a violation of the injunction. Once the violation injunctions get filed, that would that would trigger, we will send all that documentation to the state attorney and to the judge and an investigation is going to start. And in some cases, it becomes a criminal matter at that point. So if you if you feel that somebody violated you uh, the injunction, please file an in a violation as soon as possible. Also, another tip is if you live in the same household with this individual and, and, and you share computers, make sure you either change your passwords or, or use a different computer. Sometimes your uh, computer can get hacked and delete anything that you were looking or, or looking in the computer just to, to avoid uh, further, further escalate the situation. Next. So also at our website, myorangecourt.com, you can contact us. And if you go there, you go on the navig navigation bar and you select injunctions and you can have um, you can ask any question. If the case is, is a confidential case, we can give you any information, but you if you have general questions about how to file, where to go, how time you what time you open, you can select there and ask any questions that you may have. Next. Okay, thank you, Jose. So you. actually wanted to actually take a question, um, yes. uh, Jose, with you that was uh, submitted. Yes. And, and there has been questions about this before. Somebody was asking, why do they have to fill out the paperwork twice? Time is of the essence, of course. The user has more time. Um, can you explain in certain situations when they're filing for an injunction why they may have to fill out the paperwork more than once? Or maybe um, twice or a third time, a lot of times it may be because of errors or something's not filled out correctly, right? So what, what do they mean by more than once? They, so so the way it works, um, you have to file the paperwork and we've submitted to the judge and in those, in, in, to the court. And in that paperwork, it's going to have all the information that the court is looking for. There are times that the paperwork is incomplete or there or, or something is missing and the court requires to fill out the paperwork again for some reason. Because sometimes when some people file for an injunction, it can get denied the first time. And the judge was given an explanation, it was denied because either they selected the wrong type of injunction or they put any they didn't put sufficient information. So it did require to fill out an additional paperwork. And it, it for to answer the question, it's just the court needs more information in order to grant or deny the injunction. Okay. Great. Thank you, Jose. Appreciate that. Sure. So now we're going to move on to our next presentation. So up next, we have the Director of Youth and Community Services at Harbor House, Daniel Ortiz. And Daniel will share with us resources available at Harbor House to assist survivors of domestic violence. Thank you for joining us, Daniel. Take Thank you. Away. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Daniel Ortiz. I am the director at Harbor House for our Youth and Community Services. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about an overview of domestic violence and the services that are provided by Harbor House. So as we heard earlier, the legal definition for domestic violence here at Harbor House, we define it as a pattern of behavior in a relationship that is used to gain and maintain power and control over an intimate partner. Abuse can be physical, sexual, emotional, it can be economic or psychological, uh, threats of actions that influence another person. This includes that frightened, intimidate, terrorize, manipulate, hurt, blame, injure, or wound someone. Now, the main thing here is power and control, right? The part of the definition is how the abusive partner 
gains and maintains that power and control. So can here, you, our powerhouse. Can, can you hear me? Interrupt. Sorry to interrupt, but can you put your uh, PowerPoint in presentation mode? Then we can see the slides fully on the screen there. Just sure. Give me one mode. second. Sorry to interrupt, but thanks. No, that's fine. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. That works. That works? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so sorry about that. So here at Harbor House, our vision is, uh, is a leader in transforming all lives that are impacted by domestic violence. Our mission is uh, all services are free and confidential when working with, with our trained and state certified advocates. Uh, we strive to prevent and break the cycle of domestic violence through empowerment-based programs, advocacy, education, and community involvement. We are the only state certified domestic violence service provider in Orange County. We were founded in 1976. We offer empowerment-based trauma-informed programs for survivors. Uh, their children and their pets in our emergency shelter and our outreach offices throughout our community. So here at Harbor House, we also have a kennel because we identify and try to break all barriers uh, for survivors of domestic violence. At Harbor House, we work primarily with intimate partner violence. Um, so as we mentioned before, and Jose was talking about the different types of relationship, at Harbor House, the, the survivors that we're working with are in an intimate relationship. Well, we recognize that all lives are impacted by domestic violence. So here are the services that we provide. And as I mentioned before, they're free and confidential. We have a 24 seven confidential hotline that one can call uh, to receive safety planning, crisis intervention, uh, connections to emergency shelter. Uh, our emergency shelter is confidential 24 seven. As I mentioned as well, we have the onsite kennel uh, that supports all, all pets that may be coming in. Uh, residential services include emergency housing, transitional housing, uh, ways in which we can get folks back into the community through our rapid housing programs. We do safety planning with certified advocates. Our court and legal advocacy, so we have advocates that are co-located within several law enforcement agencies, as well as in the court system, and I'll speak about those specifically in a moment. Uh, we help victims with relocation. We provide counseling and support groups, youth programs from daycare to summer camps, um, a one week long summer camp called Camp Hope and our prevention programs for youth where we have uh, youth advocates that go out into the community and provide uh, a curriculum that works with, uh, with young children, uh, whether it's middle school and or high school, to build on healthy relationships. So as I mentioned before, being co-located within our within several law enforcement agencies, our early victim engagement program, it is a collaborative effort between the Orange County government and Harbor House. Our goal is to detect domestic violence cases with high potential for lethality and proactively reach out to survivors. So we basically are getting the police reports live as they're coming in and we're calling the survivor on that's listed on the report to provide them advocacy, um, any information or referrals that we may be able to make and hopefully get them uh, into a safe place. We have crisis counseling, case management, victim compensation, safety planning, advocacy, and guidance regarding the justice system. So when it comes to our court and legal program, working within the Orange County Courthouse, Harbor House Legal Advocacy Team offers a wealth of knowledge and expertise to help you with injunctions for protections, translation services, court accompaniment, and crisis intervention. Now, this program is extremely important, especially with what we're talking about today. As Jose mentioned, uh, we're located inside the courthouse. So if anyone has any questions regarding the injunctions, um, related to intimate partner violence, they can come and seek assistance from one of our advocates in our court program, as well as our injunctions for protection program. We have attorneys on site that will be able to provide uh, consultations as well. 
So as I mentioned, we have the assistance with the injunctions, crisis counseling, safety plan, all of our services in our courts and all of the programs that we provide are free and confidential. So just a few stats on what Harbor House has been able to do, and this is last year, the, our fiscal year 22-23. Uh, we have impacted over 37,000 lives with our services. Uh, the agency provided over 111,000 services to survivors of domestic violence. Last year, we held roughly 909 shelter residents, about 7,322 outreach participants, and we housed 74 pets in our kennel. We also provided about 23,000 hours of youth and adult counseling. In addition, as I mentioned, regarding our EVE program, uh, we read roughly around 10,000 police reports and assisted with 2,600 cases. Uh, we had 24 transitional housing residents. Our attorneys in the IFP program assisted 971 survivors, and we have 493 children live in our emergency shelters. So as when we talk about domestic violence and it impacting everyone. As you can see from the stats, we have touched almost every arm of our social services, providing programming, as well as in the legal and court systems. Sorry. Recognizing the forms of violence, as I mentioned before, we have sexual, physical, it can be financial. Now, these different forms of violence don't necessarily fall always into the legal definition, right? So when we think of emotional uh, form of violence, it could be someone that is putting someone down, someone that's humiliating someone. Um, whether it's spiritual, they could be taking away their right to believe in something or practice a religion. Oftentimes, folks, abusive partners may use um, spiritual to kind of gain and maintain that power and control. Clearly, we know the physical pieces, right? We think of, when we think of forms of violence, it's always about what we can see. A lot of these, unfortunately, are scars that are unseen. When we think of um, financial, not being able to work, holding someone away from schooling, not being able to advance in their career, are all different ways in which we can, which we identify as a form of violence. Give me one Okay, so warning signs for survivors. Um, oftentimes you may see someone that might be acting anxious or there might be some personality changes, um, excuses for some injuries that you may see on them, uh, cancels plans last minute. These are some of the things that we may see with someone that might be experiencing domestic violence. Does not mean that they are. These are just signs for us to be aware of when we're kind of putting the bigger picture together. When we think of abusive partners, these are some of the kind of kind of the characteristics that we may see. Maybe acts like a victim all the time, um, isolates and keeps them from people, acts superior, um, maybe charming sometimes. Uh, oftentimes, abusive partners may not want to seem to everyone else as they are the abuser. So they may hide themselves behind their charisma or how they may present to other folks that are around the survivor. So recognizing some of the barriers, right? I mentioned that we have a kennel because pets can be in a, a huge barrier to someone maybe seeking safety. Um, having to leave the home, pets are often considered part of the family. Abusive partner would, tech, would usually use a, a pet as a way to show that or intimidate the survivor um, into not leaving or making them, you know, fearful of them. We have fear. We have, there may be some emotional um, attachments. Court and legal, obviously, when we think of in which way the uh, the survivor may have to go, let's say they want to file for an injunction, as Jose mentioned, it is a process. You have to maybe take a day off, then go back the next day, go two weeks later. All of these barriers are what survivors face when they are deciding to either leave their relationship or what the next steps are in seeking assistance um, from one of our agencies as well.
And I apologize, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties here. Okay, so how do we respond to domestic violence? The key takeaways here are, is be understanding. Right. If someone is sharing a story with you or letting you know that they may be experiencing domestic violence, take the time to listen to them. Have empathy. Um, it's not just having sympathy and feeling sorry for the individual, but really feeling what they're going through. Remaining neutral is important because oftentimes we may have folks that will come to us and want to share, but maybe not overshare. And they they, they want to test the waters to see how you're going to react. Right. Providing opinions and advice is not always the best. We want to make sure that we're listening to them and that we're supporting them in their decisions, um, letting them know that there are services out there and providing resources for them. How do we, how are we trauma informed? We recognize behaviors are an adaptation to trauma, understanding how trauma might persist for someone or how it might be perceived when the person might be going through it, creating a safe environment for them making it trustworthy, supporting their choice, right? For so long, when we talk about power and control, that has been taken away from them. Being able to give that back to a survivor, that's empowerment-based, right? Understanding that we are giving them the options, we're giving them the information so that they can make an informed decision for themselves. Focusing on their strengths, promoting resilience. Uh, Self-care is important and empowering survivors. And one thing we always wanna keep in mind is Minimizing re-traumatization. Trauma does not always present itself. Um, so we want to do as much as we can to not re-traumatize an individual. Leaving is not just one step. Oftentimes we have to consider the, the totality of circumstances, right? Maybe their safety is their home or their job, or they're in, in fear of leaving because the potentiality of the escalation of violence. So leaving is not just one step. Danger increases when the survivor gains independence or pulls away from the abuser, right? We go back to that initial definition about gaining and maintaining that power and control. Not only getting the power and control, but how does that abusive partner hold on to the power, right? So when someone has decided to leave, they are at risk of losing that power and control, meaning the abusive partner. Therefore, it does escalate the risk for violence. So how do we refer our survivors of domestic violence? We have our crisis hotline. Um, if they wish to speak with an advocate, they can feel free to call us on our hotline. There's also the Florida domestic violence hotline and our national domestic abuse hotline. Things we include in our safety plan. So everyone that calls our hotline or engages with one of our advocates inside of any of one of our programs um, will receive a safety plan, a unique safety plan. Because safety plans, even though we have a few bullet points here, they are unique to that individual. Not everyone lives exactly the same life. So we have to sit down and speak with the person and really kind of hone in on a safety plan for them. But it can include being safe at home, having important numbers, maybe having a go bag. Uh, Jose mentioned clearing browsers, right? So those are ways in which we can safety plan with the individual. Tracking devices is a big thing nowadays. So we want to make sure that we're kind of going down. There's a little emoji on the side of a checklist, but that's really what it is. We want to make sure that we're working with the individual so that they can remain safe in their situation. As I mentioned, these are the services that we provide. Other community resources could be other state certified centers, working with Victim Service Center, sometimes maybe needing legal aid. So if someone is looking for an injunction or wants to take it further, wants to talk about a divorce or anything related to other legal services, our advocates are not lawyers, so we would not provide legal advice. We would refer out to a maybe like a legal aid or our um, injunction for protection program, right? We have transitional housing, housing programs just meeting their basic needs, service providers. Uh, maybe they need assistance with immigration, documentation, so we'll refer those to those uh, resources as well. Core services, law enforcement, mental health services, we have counseling, we can refer out to counseling, and medical professionals. So if you know someone or you are, are maybe are being abused, you can reach out to Harbor House. Feel free to reach out to us by calling our 24-7 hotline 
or texting us, or feel free to reach out to us on our email. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Daniel. Great information. And actually, before you go, um, well, you'll be with us during the Q&A, uh, but we do have a couple questions. Just wanted to run by you that is directly related to your uh, presentation. Uh, we had uh, uh, an attendee asking us about the shelter for children and if the emergency shelter is safe for children. Related to that question was if toddlers um, are able to go to the shelter as well. Can you kind of expand on that for us? Sure. Uh, the primary premise of our emergency shelter is to provide safety for all. So we do, we accept everyone um, into our shelter. We accept women, we accept men um, and, and their children, right? So we wanna make sure that everyone is safe. We even have a on-site daycare and childcare program where should the uh, abuse, the survivor be working or maybe need respite or any assistance while they're in appointments, we provide daycare as well for the children that are there. And yes, toddlers are, there's no age for the children. No age, so, okay, great. And uh, another question, how can you help with the injunction besides the paperwork uh, if, if they have a problem filling it out? So with the injunction, what they'll do is they'll meet with one of our attorneys. Um, and not only is it about the paperwork, but the attorneys will be able to advise and discuss the, their case in, in totality, right? Thinking about safety, whether this is the right move to do right now, um, they will provide them with all the information. Additionally, when we're talking about um, the paperwork is making sure like they're, they're attorneys. So they know how to draw up the paperwork. They know what might be missing, what might be needed in order to file the injunction. So they have the expertise. So that's that's the benefit of having the attorneys there so that you can speak with someone that is an expert who's an attorney that can provide legal advice specific to your case, not just general. Okay. And I guess before we move on, one more question we'll take here that just came in. Is there any support available for someone who has left an abusive situation, achieved financial stability, but now faces unexpected financial difficulties that may force them to return to the abuser's home? Yeah, so we have we have a uh, our so the programs that I oversee are community service programs. So we provide an array of services that that are not necessarily connected to someone maybe leaving the relationship or having to go into shelter, but our community services provides counseling, provides external resources, information, can connect them with other community resources so that we can potentially block all of the obstacles and the barriers that someone might be facing. We recognize that usually it we find that there's this aftercare component, right? That it's not just going to be, and as I mentioned before, leaving is not just one step. There, there might be stages to this. And so our community services can walk up, walk someone through that process and connect them with the, with the appropriate resources to do so. Okay, thank you, Daniel. That's Daniel Ortiz, Director of Youth and Community Services at Harbor House of Central Florida. If you're just joining us, uh, welcome to the Orange County Clerk of Courts a legal Matters Legal Forum, and tonight's topic is on domestic violence awareness. Uh, just to remind everybody, this is being recorded, and we'll have it available later on on our website, social media. And a reminder, you can submit questions during uh, this webinar in the Q&A section that you see at the bottom of your screen. So uh, we have one more presentation to get to. Now let's get a perspective on how the Sheriff's Office is involved in protecting survivors. Joining us now is Assistant Squad Leader for Civil Injunctions, Sandra Lane Cole. Sandra. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Sorry about that. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we should. Sure okay, can. great. All right. Today, we're gonna, I will give you a brief synopsis of the judicial process for injunctions. Uh, give me one second. I'm waiting okay. for my screen. Charlene, thanks. All right, next screen, please. 
Um, as Jose has mentioned, there are like eight types of injunctions. He's covered the first five. I will talk to you about the chapter 39, risk protections and exploitation of vulnerable adults. Please excuse my voice. I still have a respiratory infection. Um, the chapter 39 are for abuse of a child. These are initiated by the Department of Children and Families. These are, can be physical, it can be uh, sexual. It's just for the protection of the children. Um, our risk protections are filed on someone who poses a threat to themselves or others by having firearms or ammunition within their custody. This is usually done when a law enforcement officer is called to a scene for someone who um, may seem in distress. And uh, if it's deemed, uh, they file these risk protections. We also have the exploitation of vulnerable adults. These are for the elderly people. This is only for the misuse of their assets, their funds. This can be done by um, a caregiver, someone that they invite into their homes to take care of them. This person may in turn may get access to their monies, their accounts, their credit cards, and use all of that for their own purposes, not for the use and taking care of the adult. These orders can be filed by the guardian. It can be filed by the elderly adult themselves, or they can have someone file for them on their behalf. This is done within the probate courts. <clears throat> Next file, please. Following the injunction, as Jose stated, it falls with the petition and your evidence. For me, when you're filing with your petitions, please fill out all the information necessary that they ask for, down with the name, the race, the nicknames, their date of birth, their height. All these things are important for our deputies to know who these people are, what they look like. They can get an idea. We've had somewhere we just have a name. We have no description at all. That is not very helpful. We are unable to look up or investigate these to get the addresses, to get the date of birth. Because we have, let's say, Robert Jones. There could be several Robert Jones. Without a date of birth to affix to something else, it's kind of difficult to do. And as Jose stated, all these petitions are reviewed by the judges and then they issue your temporary or your order setting hearings to see if um, an injunction can be set if they don't institute a temporary right away. Once all this is done and the order comes to us from the courts, then the process for the injunction start. The next, pro next file, please. <clears throat> for processing an injunctions, once we receive it, it is, has to be entered into our FCIC NCIC database, which is the Florida Crime Information Center and the National Crime Information Center. These have to be entered into this database within 24 hours of it being given to us. Now, the two fields that we're talking about, two database, the FCIC and the NCIC, they Let's we'll see. An example would be if someone is incarcerated, let's say in Hillsborough, and there's an injunction taken out against this person. Once this person, and we are not aware of this, that they're in uh, incarcerated, once they are about to be released, that county inputs their name and information into the database. It in turn returns that they do have an injunction against them and they are able to be served once they contact us during the working hours, our warrants unit, which will then send them a copy to have them signed off on. Um, once we put it into our, into these systems, these databases, we give our work to our coworker so they can set and verify the information to ensure all the information is accurate as it pertains to the information sheet that, that is filled out and the petition all the information that's on there is what is going to be entered into the two databases. So that's why we request that you make sure you have everything filled out, that it is complete, and your handwriting, please, to be legible, because we cannot guess if it's going to be a five or a three. That information has to be provided. Once we uh, have them 
sign off on it, it is scanned into our own base system. Our own base system is like our electronic filing cabinet. Every, in, every injunction since the 90s is in this database system. Um, if the petitioner happens to call us to see the status of it, we would put in the case number. We would put in um, the person's name. So that hope card that you will be getting has that information on there that would be helpful to you to provide to us so we can look up to see the status of your case, whether it's served or not served. Right. Once we have it into that system, we prepare a package so the deputies can serve to the respondent. Next slide. Once the deputy receives this, we the deputies receive enforceable injunctions and our civil process officers receive the non-enforceable. The non-enforceable, first of all, would be like your order setting hearing, your mandatory hearing. The deputies do the actual injunctions as listed previously, your temporaries, your finals, extendeds, they serve those. Excuse me. Um, a lot of people are concerned about the, why does it take so long to serve? We also have to take into account our deputies are handling a caseload. They're not just serving injunctions. They're dealing with evictions. They're doing rid of writs. They're doing our replevins. They have sometimes 60 cases or more, give or take a month, as well as the CPOs, because they handle summonses, notices, evictions, three and five days, subpoenas, divorces, out-of-state documents. All this is handled, so it does take time to, excuse me, takes time for them to serve. They do make several attempts during the course of the day to attempt service. Uh, they may get, let's say they get it tomorrow. They'll try it that day, let's say at seven o'clock. If they have time within that day, they may go back during the midday and then they will go later on during the day. Those are different times, different days they would try to make service. Once they have made service with your injunctions, the petitioner, which is you, is notified of the service. This is so that you can protect yourself because usually once it is served, runs the risk of more retaliation. So they are notify you. They notify you by the number that you provide on your information sheet or what you may have on a petition, but it's more likely what's on the information sheet. So please make it legible and clear. Make sure that you set up your voicemail that you can get voice messages and that the number is in working condition. Once the, <clears throat> once the order is returned to the unit, we update a served or non-served. Non-served meaning that they were unable to serve it due to person has moved. Uh, the phone number that was connected with that is no longer in service or that, um, you know, person has moved or they no longer live there and no further address is provided for that. Next slide, please. This is the components of a um, an order. This is starting from the bottom. The petition, which is all the information that you provide in order to get your, your injunction, the order in which the judge signs off on, the information sheet that you fill out with your information and the respondent's information, and then the return of service, which is we create with our CPMS, which is our civil management processing system. Slide, please. Now, but there are different, when I say there are different types of injunctions, there are different, um, there's only two, there's two, the temporary and your final. Now your temporary and your final can be either extended, which can mean that the date has been extended, amended, where something has been corrected within the order, modified, where it's a change to something, an address, a date of birth, a spelling of a name, something has been changed in there. Now this can be done also to finals. And as Jose stated, your finals in effect for a year, non-expiring, whatever the 
church teams. <laughs> Next, please. There are different kinds of injunctions. I'm sorry, there are different kinds of conditions within your injunctions, such as um, the respondent shall not threaten the family or the household of the protected person, um, the visitation rights for the um, to kids, um, restraint from communication, um, prohibited from processing or purchasing firearms, and who the kids or even pets may be awarded to. There are different ones, all deemed by the judge. He decides what is pertinent in your case. Next slide, please. And we come towards the end. For us, this would be a dismissal. Now, the reasons for your dismissal is whether the respondent or the petitioner submits a motion to the judge, whether it's approved or not. The petitioner is not present, can possibly trigger a dismissal. But all this is deemed by the judge. Once the judge issues that order, it comes down to our department. We clear this entry out of FCIC and CIC. We indicate that it's dismissed within the civil process management system. So that if your name is brought up within that FCCI database, they will see that you had that an injunction was placed on a person, but that it was also cleared that stays in your system for a couple of years but it will always say it's been cleared dismissed so that covers that instant and as far as we have with um, our injunctions so we do update all injunctions once it, we receive them and this can be called in from our deputies even out of county we handle injunctions not only from our Orange County, we handle them from surrounding counties as well as out of state. Um, all these injunctions are all handled in the same manner. All notifications are handled in the same manner. What information you provide for us is the information that is inputted and a phone number is the one that is used to call you in that case. And that is the end. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sandra. Uh, so uh, we've, got, we've gotten to that point of our webinar where we're going to take some more questions. That was all our presentations uh, from our different presenters. And so if you have a question, remember you can submit it in the Q&A portion at the bottom of your screen. I do want everyone to know that we cannot get into specific case information, okay? Of course, we cannot talk about specific case information. So please be aware of that. But if you have a question for our panel, you can submit that in the Q&A at this time. And we do have a couple of questions. So, and I'm just going to uh, go through these and whoever on our panel feels they can answer the question, uh, feel free to chime in and help us out here. All right, so what if, um, this is a question about uh, a, a protective order, an injunction. I assume this would be a final judgment. Uh, question is, what if the abuser filed a petition with the family court for visitation and you and your child have a complete stay away active order protections from criminal and family court? Would the family court honor the order of protections? So so that's a, that's a good question. So when somebody comes to file a, an injunction or restraining order with us, one of the things that we do is we look for related cases. Uh, any related cases they get combined with that injunction they use, that they file. So when that is being sent to the court, the court has all that information. If they have a previous case, if they have a visitation case, the court will know all, the, all that information before they make a ruling. In the event, that they have a case in another county, that person, once they know that an injunction was filed, they can come to our office and submit that documentation, letting the court know here that there's another case in another county, and the court will take that into consideration and make a decision. Okay, thank you, Jose. Um, we've got a few more here, and again, submit your question if you have one. 
Okay. Um, so some of the questions have really been dealing with resources and um, centered on financial stability. So, and it looks like, you know, if somebody has a financial situation going on and they're even considering, uh, they might be in dire straits or even consider going back to live with the abuser and that sort of thing. So the, they're looking for those types of resources. So um, Daniel uh, with uh, Ortiz with Harbor House, Daniel, um, this is where I think if you you can share your contact information or the ways people can get the information through Harbor House or any other resources for financial assistance for, um, for a, a survivor. Sure. So I would say the, the main point of entry into all services here at Harbor House would be through our domestic violence hotline, right? They can reach out there. They can be connected to any one of our services, whether it's our community programs or if they need uh, any assistance within the court or the legal, we can provide all of the internal referrals as well. Um, additionally, in our community programs, we also have uh, economic justice coordinator, which provides financial literacy, financial counseling. Um, we take a look at each case and all of the obstacles and the barriers that the survivors are facing um, and link them with the services. We may be even able to provide some of those financial assistance depending on the case specifics. Um, but yes, so feel free to reach out to me as well. If there's any additional questions, I'm going to provide you over my email. It's D Ortiz. D O R T I Z at harborhouse fl.com. Okay. So again, that's D Ortiz. Maybe repeat that again because I thought I was going to remember it, but I didn't. <laughs> D Ortiz at harborhouse there you go. fl.com. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. No problem. Okay, our next question, Ms. Sandra, in the hypothetical case that the petitioner does not attend due to threats from the aggressor, and later another petition is presented, what is the dominant criterion? Hmm. I don't know. I understand that question. Do you? <laughs> no, I, I, okay. If the person, what I gather is if you're asking me if the respondent threatens the petitioner and about coming to court well at that point i would say it would be better one if you have this order in place is to make a report of the threats um you would try to contact the clerk of course to see if you can to hmm, this is really difficult now i'm trying to see here because well, i know you need you. to make stuff let Thank me help you, you here, Sandra. so if somebody file an injunction in First of all, when you come to court, you're going to be separated. You're not going to be in the same same room before court. You're going to be there uh, with a deputy. If for some reason you can't come to court, the case will get dismissed. And then the second petition is the one they're only going to consider. So if the event that the first petitions get dismissed because you didn't attend, they, they, uh, and then you file a second one, the one that the court is going to consider is the second one. The first one was dismissed. So it has to be new allegations. So it's important if you don't feel safe. Yeah, I forgot to mention this. If When you file for a restraining order, if you feel that you're staying with a family member or somebody else, you can file for a confidential address. So the abuser doesn't know where you're residing. When you come to court, you're going to be separated in different rooms before you go to court. It's going to be a deputy there. There's going to be people from Harbor House that it make you feel safe. But it's important that you make that a court date because otherwise they will dismiss that injunction. And then the police will not be able to, to help you and invent something up. Okay, great. Thank you, Jose. Sandra. Okay, so let's say we have, well, a couple more questions left here. We have one, uh, one submitted at this point, but if, you, if uh, anybody else has any questions, make sure to submit them. Because um, we're getting towards the end of our Q and A and our panel and presentations here on our forum tonight, so um, some general questions about how can we help? 
uh, meaning we've got attendees tonight on online watching this, asking how can we help to volunteering, fundraising, and expanding housing, maybe. Basically, how can we help uh, and, and be advocates? So anyone want to take that on? I'm sure Harbor House is a resource in the area where people, they can always use people to serve and volunteer. Um, United Way is another um, avenue. The, the clerk of courts does a fundraising campaign each year for United Way. Uh, Harbor House receives funds from United Way, but Daniel? Yeah, so we have a robust volunteer program here. Um, so that means if anyone wants to get involved, please reach out to us. Um, we welcome all volunteers to come, whether it is to provide assistance with us in the court or our community programs. When we talk about awareness, like this being Domestic Violence Awareness Month, uh, we go out into uh, different agencies. Um, I've done several presentations and speaking engagements for other folks, maybe even some um, agencies where they want to know more about domestic violence. Well, what are some of the things that they can do? So how we spread awareness is exactly by doing the things that we're doing tonight, right? You are on the webinar, you hear it, you provide the information, you spread the word. Um, again, we accept uh, volunteers getting involved, donations, there are signature events, follow us on all of our social media web pages, our Instagram, our Facebook. There are always updates and where uh, the community can get involved. Correct, and I was just thinking about an event we partnered with you on is uh, the door hanging event. Mm -hmm. uh, where Harbor House and volunteers go out to different communities mm -hmm. uh, where there's been higher rates of domestic violence to yeah. put out information. Um, yeah. You, yeah, maybe you want to share a little bit more detail on that one. Uh, yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so we, we, we partner with, with local agencies, law enforcement and courts. We go out and we hang information on doors. We basically go out into the community spreading awareness of domestic violence and how there are different ways to reach out um, to us and also to our partner agencies. There are several different things that we are involved in. Um, I know this Thursday, there's one at the Orange County Courthouse that we'll be at. Um, we have different uh, events that we host throughout the year, our Pause for Peace. So there's, there's a, a, an array of different activities throughout the year, not just Domestic Violence Awareness Month, because we know that it's not just happening this month. And this is, month is not only to raise awareness, but it is a year long thing. So please follow us on our, on our social medias and get involved um, in one of our activities. Okay. Great, Daniel. And um, we are also having a question about what is your Facebook page. So for Orange County Clerk of Courts, just, and usually you can just search for these, but I don't know if you have your specific handle for your Facebook same, page. Same, I would say the same thing, Harbor House, Central Florida, you'd be able to find it on, on Facebook. Okay. Uh, there's a question about fundraising. So I mentioned that earlier. Um, Harbor House, I assume, does some fundraising. I mentioned our United Way campaign. United Way does, uh, Harbor House receives funds from through United Way. So that's one way um, that uh, Harbor House receives funds. I don't know if you have uh, want to mention anything else, Daniel, related to that. There's, I mean, there's, there's different ways. So we have our, you can connect with us either through myself, I can connect you with our development department, but whether it's one of our staple events, which is like walk a mile, uh, pulse or peace, our purple door luncheon. So there, there are larger events where we, where folks can get involved, but we're always accepting donations as well. Um, monetary donations, anything, anything of the source that are able, that are resources that are able to help survivors. Um, if you feel free to reach out to, like I said, to myself and I'll connect you with our development team. They're the ones that handle, um, the fundraising efforts here at, at Harbor House. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. looks like I think we're done. We're through the questions. So if there's no other further questions, then uh, we're about wrapping it up here for tonight. But don't go just yet uh, because we you will have a survey that will pop up once we end this webinar. We ask you to please take that survey. It helps give us feedback, provides great information for us as we uh, get ideas for uh, future webinars and forums like this and um, see where, you know, what we hit on was, that was good and what was missing, what you'd like to see. So don't forget to take our survey. 
want to remind everybody that uh, your Orange County Clerk of Courts, Tiffany Moore Russell, understands the importance of these conversations, and it's why she has developed these legal forums um, as a service to the community. They're always free. We try to do them at least twice a year, so look for them in the future as we have others on different various topics, legal topics. Um, it's the top priority of Clerk Russell, and we hope that you find this information uh, very useful. So once again, take our survey. If you're looking for a recording of this, we will get it up on our website and our Facebook pages. Look for our social media channels with the Orange County Clerk of Courts. And we thank you for joining us. Have a great night.